Hello and welcome to Tune In 2022. My name is Eric Francis Coppolino, the host of Planet Waves FM and the author of the Planet Waves Horoscope, here with the very first moments of the 2022 annual edition, um, which, um, as you can see, a moment ago was called Tune In 2022. And um, this uh, reading is 12 uh, one hour audio presentations. Uh, for the sun, the sun signs and the and the rising signs, and uh, and then four video presentations. The first of which is this one. The uh, the four video presentations are going to serve as a, a general introduction and also an introduction to the signs by quadruplicity. I'll explain what that means in a moment, but uh, mostly it means cardinal, mutable, and fixed signs. Uh, so. Um, rather than doing a video for every sign, I'm doing an audio for every sign, but I'm going to sum up the action on the cross, on your particular cross, or the one that you might be curious about, uh, j just like that. So uh, let's uh, start with a, a very basic introduction to the, uh, the, the ways that we can divide up the astrological signs. The, the way that most people are familiar with dividing up the astrological signs uh, is by element. And you can see that the fire signs here are in red and the water signs are in blue and the uh, the earth signs are in brown. Uh, and uh, we're all familiar with that, earth, air, fire, and water, of course. And um, Western astrology is, um, is, is missing uh, something about metal, the element that conducts. But I guess all the elements in Western astrology are seen to have their own particular way of conducting. Uh, and so uh, this is one way to do things, earth, air, fire, and water. And uh, in, in each, right, let's, let's hold that thought. Okay, the other way to divide the signs up is uh, by where they fall in relationship to the seasons. Uh, so every season begins with a cardinal sign. That begins the northern hemisphere uh, spring, northern hemisphere summer, northern hemisphere autumn, Northern Hemisphere winter, or we reverse it, Southern Hemisphere spring, Southern Hemisphere summer, Southern Hemisphere autumn, and Southern Hemisphere winter. And uh, each, of, um, each season contains a cardinal fixed and mutable sign. So each season... Uh, yeah, each season contains a cardinal fixed and beautiful side. Looking at these, I'm having to think it through. Like, wow, I haven't quite seen it presented this way in, in a long time. And now these cardinal fixed and mutables are known as the crosses. So, for example, there's your cardinal cross. It's Aries, Libra, Capricorn, and Cancer. That is the cardinal cross. It's the one in uh, this kind of dark red color. And that is the, 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 the cross that, that begins every season and then the 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 then these develop into the fixed signs the fixed cross is Taurus Scorpio Leo and Aquarius those represent the peak energy of every season and then there is the uh, the last type of sign of the season which is a mutable sign and the and the mutable signs uh, are the first mutable sign is Gemini, and that's followed by Virgo, that's followed by Sagittarius, and that is followed by Pisces. And the, the mutable signs uh, mean means changeable, and uh, and what, what changes is that mutable signs uh, are said in classical astrology to uh, represent the, uh, the, the balancing between fixed and mutables, between fixed and, and cardinal. So what, what they mutate between is a fixed type energy and a cardinal type energy and a fixed a fixed type energy likes to begin things uh let's say that again a uh, a cardinal type energy begins things so 
Pardon me, the first one is always a little rough here. Uh, and I've got a, a new set of concepts to uh, introduce, which I have never really talked about this in any astrological presentation. So that's interesting. Um, so the, the quality of the how a season develops is that when the, when the new season begins, there's a surge of energy of some kind. Um, and, and when the season peaks, it's, it seems very stable, and uh, it's, it's like, uh, for, you know, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere when the sun's in Leo and it's high summer, and it just feels like it's just never going to cool off. And then the autumn comes, and then that energy starts to shift and starts to break up, and it's, it starts to dissolve in, into, in, into the, ne the next season when the, the, then there's a surge of energy again. And so uh, that's that uh, refreshing feeling that comes with the autumn and uh, is, is an example of a, a cardinal sign in the north. It's Libra. And, uh, and, and then the, the autumn peaks in, in a fixed sign, Scorpio, and then it dissolves into winter in a mutable sign, Sagittarius. And so Sagittarius has that in the north. Sometimes it feels like autumn and sometimes it feels like winter there are autumny days there are there are wintry days and so it's 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 shifting and so when you're trying to learn the signs it, it helps to, to have this general breakdown of what the signs are in terms of their basic categorizations and know uh, whether you're dealing with a cardinal mutable or fixed sign and then whether you're dealing with uh, what element you're you're dealing with uh, a very good book that explains this beautifully is called The Book of Toth by Aleister Crowley, at one time said to be the evilest man in the world, and you'll see him coming up in various Illuminati videos. And um, You know, Cr Crowley spent a lot of his time in a cabin about 75 miles from where I'm sitting writing astrology books for Evangeline Adams. So uh, anyone who tells you that he was a you know member of the Illuminati and you know r r run, secretly running the world... He had a great job if he was able to sit in a ca cabin owned by Evangeline Adams and ghostwrite books for her, which never got, he was never credited for until quite recently. Anyway, the Book of Toth uh, is a book about the tarot, but it, it is a book that explains the elements beautifully. It explains the seasons beautifully. It explains the uh, the the quadruplicities beautifully, cardinal, fixed, and mutable, that kind of thing. And uh, it is it is worth spending. A couple of years with, uh, with a special notebook and a pencil, and taking notes, and so that's where I learned the most about how these things work way back early on in my career. And you learn a lot about tarot cards as well. Okay, so uh, cardinal cross. So I have um, isolated the events on the cardinal cross, in, you know, into uh, into those signs. I've I've left out almost everything that's not on the cardinal cross. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll come to those in later videos about the fixed immutable crosses, but right now I want to just focus in on each cross. And, and the thing to bear in mind is that the, um, the qualities of the, of, the, of the cross and the events on the cross affect everything on the cross. This is different from what happens in the earth signs doesn't quite have the same impact as everything else in the earth signs, but everything on the cross has a similar influence as everything else on the on the cross, and you can just see this from experience, and it's partly about about the type of aspect uh, that is involved, right? Because what's on the same cross is going to tend to be a conjunction, an opposition, or a square, and those are the aspects that tend to speak the most loudly and the most clearly, and, and that we notice the most. And it can take some uh, practice to be able to feel and work with the um, the the, the uh, aspects that have a slightly lighter touch. Um, so for example, a, a square means, uh, one, for example, a planet in one mutable sign to another mutable sign. So for example, something between Gemini and Virgo is a square. And so that square is really gonna be felt by the entire mutable cross. Uh, a book that explains this brilliantly is um, is called Whole Sign Houses by Robert Hand, and it it starts off as like a, a 50, 60 page pamphlet. It starts a whole movement in astrology, and then ultimately became the basis for Rob's PhD thesis, uh, as he explained it to me, uh, which was about um, uh, m medieval military strategy astrology. 
there is such a thing, and one person in the entire world has his PhD um, in this. And so Rob explains how we go from things like the concept of a, um, of, of a uh, cardinal sign to the concept of a square, which is an aspect between, uh, b- between cardinal signs, uh, for, for example. So all that said, let's talk about what's going on on the cardinal cross. And the, this affects uh, everyone. Uh, it's especially pronounced for people who have planets on the, on the cardinal cross. But the thing about the cardinal cross is that it, that it contains points that are um, highly relevant to everyone because the cardinal signs themselves are so personal. Uh, so the cardinal cross is probably, uh, you know, there's the only three crosses, but it's fair to say it's the most influential of the three crosses um, because it contains the actual change in season it contains the 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 quarter days the you know equinoxes um and um and the solstices and uh the sign aries is where the entire uh zodiac is is reckoned from and so uh that it is uh the place where the spring it's the position in the sky where the sun is on the first day of northern hemisphere spring so uh, all, all things are reckoned from the first degree of aries and th- and that makes the first degree of aries uh, very close to a, a personal point uh something like the ascendant or or the sun or the moon and the the aries point as it's called or um, as some mm-hmm. other uh, some as more astronomers refer to it as the sidereal vernal point uh is an influential a point in everyone's chart and also in everyone's life and in in the um in for, you know for example in the historical process the aries point gets a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of emphasis things that happen on the aries point tend to influence many people and so th- therefore by extension what's going on in aries and on the cardinal cross can affect many people so the cardinal cross is a little a little more um has a little more oomph and um Let's, so let's start with what's going on in, in Aries, which is, um, you know, one of the more uh, positive things of, of, our, of our time in history. And, and that is that uh, Chiron is, on, uh, is in Aries right here. And it's going to be there for, uh, you know, for another, another uh, five years or so, four, four or five years uh, and um, at least. And th- this is the... Um, the, the energy available of self-actualization. Aries is an important sign, uh, in, 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 at least as, in my experience as an astrologer, because one of the things that Aries uh, tells us about is um, wh- where you want to find yourself and express yourself in life. And so, for example, you know, let, let's, say for, uh, let's say, for example, uh, you have... Cancer on the ascendant, Aries comes out to the tenth house, and this speaks to the uh, the the uh, underemphasized career oriented nature of the sign Cancer. Normally, we hear people born under the sign Cancer want to s- sit at home and um, uh, raise children, make oatmeal, and stuff like that. Well, can- Cancerians are quite uh, ambitious people, and one of the reasons we see that, if we flip the chart over. Uh, with Cancer on the Ascendant is that Aries is on the 10th house. So wherever you have Aries in your chart is telling you something about where you seek to find your personhood. And now with Chiron in Aries, let's re- that, that, that energy is uh, doubled or tripled over because Chiron is intense and it brings a, a lot of um, fo- focus to whatever sign that it happens to be in. And now right now it happens to be in Aries. And that is a very good thing because there are so many influences right now that are uh, gu- guiding us away from a self-orientation, guiding us away from self-awareness, guiding us away from any sense of uh, genuine autonomy. And we're being told over and over and over again by, by politicians and by news, so-called news reports and by all, all kinds of social pressure type of um, messaging campaigns and celebrity this and that is that um, the, 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 the individuality really doesn't matter. There's no, there's no need for anyone to 
to be um, an individual, but this is um, this is the language of tyrants. Uh, it is only under tyranny that individuality doesn't matter. And one of the beautiful things about the uh, the, the the experiment of freedom in the United States has been that we have been able and freedom in, in the United States and as as other countries have uh, emulated us is that uh, we are able and encouraged to find our own journey. And, and this does not conflict with collective responsibility in any way. Everyone who uh, knows that, that there's such a thing as uh, finding your way and self-actualization also knows that we have to work in a collective sphere of some kind, and um, you do both. You can do both. It's not a question of one or the other. Uh, and, and the thing with um, this uh, obsession with collectivism is that you cannot have a collective unless you have individuals to form that collective. Otherwise, you've just got a mob. So uh, whether, whether uh, some, some, some entity of uh, more than one person is a mob or whether it is a, um, a group or a committee of some kind is a, a matter of who comprises that either group or or mob. Okay, so so Chiron is there. Chiron's doing its work and Chiron is um, encouraging people to think for themselves, encouraging you to think for yourselves and wherever you may have Aries in your chart, it is giving you an extra blast of um, confidence to get it together and do uh, you know, determine and do and experience, experience, very important Chiron word, what you came here to do. There's also a point in Aries called Salacia. Oops, that, can you see that? Where, where am I? Where's my finger? Ah, pull it back a little further, I get more real estate. Okay. Uh, so, Salacia right there in a, a very early Aries. And Salacia, in my uh, experimentation with this, uh, with this point, is uh, about a process of maturity, including a kind of maturity we don't hear very often about, which is sexual maturity. And the uh, the, the understanding that if someone does not mature sexually, they're not, their personality is not going to mature. And if, they, if their personality is maturing, there's going to be an element of sexual maturity coming along uh, for the ride with that process as well. So personal development and sexual development uh, come hand in hand. Okay, finally, we've got Eris in, in Aries, and Eris has been in Aries uh, since uh, the 1920s. That's a long time. Aries takes 130 years to go through uh, Aries. It was amazing it was discovered. It's, it's currently one of the very furthest known objects uh, from the sun. And um, uh, at the time of its discovery, it was said by its discovery to be the furthest, coldest, darkest uh, thing. But it was discovered. Despite that, usually things are discovered closer in a little bit, or they're, you know, they're but it ain't close. It's far, 130 years through the sign. And, and what, what this uh, is, in my view, is a, um, the, the, the influence of what has happened to the, the human self-concept under the, uh, the influence of electronic media. So uh, as a student of the media, a student of the McLuhan family, I'm a lucky person I got to study media studies with the McLuhan family personally, which is a little like studying guitar with uh, Jerry Garcia or <laughs> someone like that personally. Um, and, um, and so what I've learned is that uh, all, all of these media things, all of these devices that, that we, we are surrounded by now and, um, you know, generally don't use that creatively, uh, transform us. And it's not the content that transforms us, but it's the, it's the device and the use of the device that transforms us. And, and by transform, I mean uh, form us into an entirely new person, an entirely new kind of person, uh, as society itself is changing. And so uh, you don't have to use the thing uh, to get, get the, the effects of it. Everybody gets the same effects, basically. Okay. So that's Eris, and um, this is a highly chaotic influence, and it's uh, creating a massive vulnerability uh, that, we're, that we're experiencing now because, um, it, 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 to me, it re represents, and, and uh, this is how I put it in my very first uh, presentation on, uh, on Eris, uh, which came out in uh, the um, 
uh, the, win- the, the winter of 2007, I wrote it in Brussels uh, with the help of Rick Tarnas, um, is that uh, we, we now live in, in a world where everything is fragmented. And the, and the fragmentation accelerated as one new type of electrical media was piled on top of the next. You know, so for example, as telephone was piled on top of telegraph, and then radio was piled on top of telephone, and then phonograph, and the movies were piled on top and piled and piled on top, and then television comes along, and then digital comes along, and and uh, by the, by the time uh, we're done with Eris Neri's, um, it's you know. Uh, we're, we're all going to be lucky to be able to utter the words I am and have it be in any way, shape, or form meaningful. Okay, uh, the next of the cardinal signs. So there's trouble in self-concept, and Chiron is here to help us heal self-concept. It's help, here, here to help us heal our self-awareness, to re- reclaim and retrieve self-awareness in a time when there's incredible pressure to yield, 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 and th- don't don't do anything that... Uh, you know, would um, you know jeopardize the group and you know, don't don't kill grandma and all this stuff. Well, we need self awareness. You need self awareness to decide and to determine what is true. You you can't do that without. You can't determine what is true for you without understanding something about you. That's Chiron in Aries. Next, there's not a lot of planets in Cancer. In fact, there's no major planets in Cancer. There's a bunch of um, smaller objects in Cancer, but what we do have in Cancer uh, are, are two what are called um, Uranian points or trans-Neptunian points. These are planets without bodies. I, I keep making reference to these. It's funny, no one ever asked me, planet without a body? Well, it's a planet that exists in math- mathematical calculation, and it ex- exists in the minds of astrologers and in some scant few astrology books, um, and the two planets are Kronos and uh, and Hades. Kronos uh, in, in Cancer is about, um, I, I think it's about uh, ad- addressing the lack of self-esteem and the lack of self-confidence confidence that makes people feel small and worthless, and it's important to understand that this is not a thing that can be built up intellectually or compensated for by being promoted and given a corner office on the top floor, but rather uh, that, that can only be found through uh, a, a, an emotional healing and emotional orientation process, a, a process of getting real, uh, a process of um, healing uh, from the, uh, the emotional influences of the past. So uh, Hades, uh, as additionally, d- drives depth, it drives us down deep into uh, who we are and who we want and who we need to be. And these are sci- uh, pl- basically planetary influences, though they are hypothetical planets, um, uh, discovered late 18th, uh, early, late 19th, early 20th century. They've been around for a long time. They've been around for uh, well over 100 years and um, are very useful, and very few astrologers use them, and some are aware of them, many are not. Okay. Next, Libra. It doesn't seem to be much going on in, in Libra either, except for one thing. There's a, there's a point situated constantly in the second degree of Libra, a deep space point called M87. Uh, Messier number 87 is a massive galaxy uh, that just uh, is basically permanently fixed in late li- early Libra. And um, it, it is one of the most influential points in the whole sky. And one of the, the reasons it's so, so influential is that it is, um, has a massive gravitational influence. It's uh, blowing a jet of, of, I guess, X-ray matter out of it. Um, and it's um, a monstrous galaxy. It dwarfs the Milky Way galaxy. And it's like a trillion suns, basically. It's as big as a trillion times the sun. That is fucking big. Okay, so uh, what we get there is um, the thing that I think in our era of history, which this, um, you know, uh, M87 precessed onto the Aries point about 300 years ago, right, right about, you know, first degree of Libra, part of the Aries point about 300 years ago, right at the time of the American Revolution, um, it is the thing that powers up the Aries point. It, it, is, uh, it is a mystery why the Aries point has as much influence as it has. Why is this thing without any mass that is merely a calculated rec- calculated reckon point in space that lines up two zodiacs? Why is that so powerful? 
Well, M87 is sitting right on the fucking cardinal cross. So M87 sitting here in Libra affects everything in, in Aries, particularly early Aries, everything in Cancer and everything in Capricorn. And so things come along and they reach two degrees to one, two, three degrees of a cardinal sign. And then they pick up the power of, um, of, of M87 and express it through the sign uh, that they're in. And, uh, the, and, and M87 is a profound influence in relationships um, and, and particularly this uh, kind of black hole style relationship that a lot of people tend to get into where they have no uh, sense of fulfillment. They're just constantly eating and, uh, and consuming and drawing things toward them and consuming, consuming, consuming. Uh, additionally, so it doesn't need to be that way. It can turn around and turn into a creating and producing, but this requires some real growth. Growth. Okay. Also, in early Libra, a point called Logos. Now, I think that though you'll never really hear another astrologer besides me, maybe every rare now and then, um, some uh, asteroid freak or something like that. Logos, though, is a um, distant point out in the Kuiper belt. It's a classical Kuiper object, 300-ish year orbit. And Logos in Libra is, Logos is, is about orienting on what makes sense and this um, impulse for things to make sense. This need for things to be sensible, to make sense, to f make sense in logic, to make sense in language, to be expressible to other people, to be understandable, and, uh, and, and to be documentable. And so I think this is a tremendously positive influence uh, and, and that is uh, encouraging of actual inquiry and the, the actual seeking of understanding. Okay. One last thing in, um, in Libra is uh, a point called Haumea. Haumea is one of the midwives of the gods and uh, is in very late Libra. Haumea does not move quickly. Haumea moves slowly. It's got one of those 300-ish year orbits, but for a long time it has been opposite uh, Eris, though now that opposition is uh, somewhat out of orb. It's been opposite Eris, and the, um, and the, the opposition has served... Uh, to make the this uh, cha chaos making fragmentation crazy making process be guided by a birth process and so it's not merely that Eris is generating chaos for many years we've had Eris standing in an opposition to Haumea which emphasizes uh, that that out of the chaos there is a birthing process that is going on, and that birthing process is simultaneous birthing process of self and other, and self-concept and, and other concept that are slowly, gradually forming. Before I move on to Capricorn, there's a, a one very important event happening on, on the fixed cross, on the, excuse me, cardinal cross here in Aries, uh, just to wrap up with this, uh, that's going to affect everyone, particularly on the cardinal cross, which is that in uh, 2526, Chiron and Eris are going to form a conjunction in Aries. And this is pretty much the next major stop on the journey of transformation represented by astrology. Okay, one last sign on the Cardinal Cross, and that sign is Capricorn. This is somewhere where there's plenty going on. Let's pull right in there and get a look at it. Or maybe I can use my little magical camera here to pull in on it. Oh, look at that. Oh, wow. How much fancier than an iPhone uh, can you get? Um, or an iMac. So those that's the activity in Capricorn. Notice, compared to the other signs on this cross, like there, there's, there's quite a lot going on in Capricorn. And so if you're wondering why there is so much going on in society why society itself seems to be crumbling. Well, let's look at Capricorn. Capricorn is a sign of our uh, prized and cherished institutions like corporations, governments, banks, and the family. And w while a few years ago, by which I mean 15 years ago, almost all the emphasis was on Sagittarius, now over uh, the, the most recent decade and a half, the emphasis has moved radically into Capricorn. And this is why society is shaking and quaking and why things seem so scary and why it seems like there's nothing to hold on to uh, and why people are trying to hold on to something that has to do with uh, the, 
the family of man, as represented by Papa Joe Biden, uh, you know, reassuring us and telling us all the uh, all, all the things that we need to do to make him happy. Now, let's take a quick inventory of all that's going on in uh, in Capricorn. Uh, the, the most important thing in the long term presence has been Pluto in Capricorn, which entered in early two thousand and eight. Uh, right, right ahead of uh, when Obama gets elected, um, and so that's uh, also concurrent with the uh, big financial shakeup in that that happened in that year. Additionally, uh, at the, at the moment as we speak, Venus is stationing retrograde in a conjunction to uh, Pluto in Capricorn. Venus will be retrograde from twelve nineteen out to um, the uh, the the end of January. Then it'll. Uh, that retrograde will end, but the important thing about the retrograde is that in our part right now, in the beginning part of the retrograde, Venus is making a long conjunction to Pluto in Capricorn. Venus conjunct Pluto in Capricorn. Okay, so that's happening. Additionally, there's a lot of stuff new in Capricorn that has just arrived in the past couple of years, and this includes a centaur, very highly charged energetic centaur called Pholus, uh, which is, uh, re relates to uh, the lid coming off and which relates to the release of the genie from the bottle uh, and, with, and in the sign associated with family and with government and with corporations and inst institutions, we are certainly seeing the lid come off. In addition to Pholus is a thing called Ixion, our friend who uh, knows no morality. Ixion is not about being immoral. Ixion is about being amoral. It's not whether one is right or wrong. It's about the notion that there is no right and no wrong. It's about squandering second chances. Ixion was uh, king of the Lapiths, a mortal, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the first human to commit murder. And, uh, and, and then when he was brought to Mount Olympus by his friend Zeus, plots to rape the, the queen of the gods, Hera. Now, any, if anyone who knows anything about Greek mythology knows that uh, the, the, the idea of, like, raping Hera is, is like pissing on the feet of an FBI agent to the hundredth power. You don't... You know, Hera was mighty and um, and uh, not not especially friendly, jealous, intense, uh, and um, Ixion, so stupid, or so crazy, or so amoral. See, that's a stupid, crazy, no wait, amoral, amoral. That's the thing. Uh, attempts to rape her, doesn't succeed in doing so. Uh, she turns herself into a cloud. He has his way with the cloud cloud version of her and gives birth to the race of centaurs except for Chiron. Chiron comes from another lineage um, so all the centaurs besides Chiron uh, come from this um, pairing of Ixion and Kronos uh, sorry, Ixion and, and Hera uh, and they're, they, they are generally not very friendly the centaurs are generally not very friendly mythological figures, they get into a lot of fights they kill a lot of people, they get rape the bride at weddings and all, all this stuff and so um, the thing is that they're also uh, half half in the real world and half not in the real world because they're, they're they have one parent who is a kind of psychotic, corrupt, amoral former king and th their, their mother is the cloud ghost astral image of, of Hera so they Centaurs, besides Chiron, are not entirely in this world. They're partly in this world. They're partly in the other world. They're part man. They're part horse. Part woman in a couple of cases. So they're, they, they, they represent um, things that straddle the line between two different major categorizations of, of people. Okay, so um, the thing about Pholus, um, so Pholus is, is descended from uh, potentially from Ixion. By the way, while I'm on the subject, there's a theory that Pholus and Chiron were the same figure and got split into two. So let's hold off on the lineage of Pholus for now, except to say that there is a powerful centaur presence in, in early Capricorn. 
Ixion is an early Capricorn. And then there's kind of a, a pro proto-American uh, de deity called Quayar, uh, also an early Capricorn. So the, the interesting thing about uh, Fol the combination of Folus and Quayar is that both of them represent family lineage related issues. They represent uh, tracking back one's ancestry in some way. Um, Qu Quayar takes us all the way back to the beginning. Uh, our people come from the Pleiades. Uh, my people come from Sicily. Uh, our tribe is the one, one of the wandering tribes of Egypt that, and so forth had diaspora Jewish people. Um, so Qu Quayar is the family, uh, the family's mythology of its origins. Okay, so wh what this gives us is, um, at, at minimum, two very important planets associated with family lineage in Capricorn, a sign very closely associated with family. And it's, Capricorn's also a sign closely associated with the state and the corporate state. And we're seeing a lot of bullshit go down with the state and the corporate state, and the state and the corporate state attempting to wholly and completely intrude upon the life of the family and the way we have relationships and whether we should uh, have uh, met, w weddings and bar mitzvahs and funerals and uh, con confirmations and all this stuff and graduation parties and Christmas dinner, the, the state suddenly has everything to say about who you should have uh, Christmas dinner with. And, you know, you can look in my inbox any day and see a press release from the governor of New York pretty much giving, giving, yacking out some bullshit about what you, what you should and shouldn't do with your family and you shouldn't have un on whatever that's called, people at your Thanksgiving dinner table. This is uh, a problem described by um, this, in a sense, uh, destabilization and, and to some extent corruption, for example by Ixion, of Capricorn. And so we, we suddenly have nothing structured that we can count on. We can't count on the family. The family's been corrupted by the state. The state's been the state's been corrupted the um the uh, the the Goulain maxwell trials going on as we speak i, I will be back in a day or so with uh, my a video reading of that chart and I'll, I'll probably cover that on the new planet waves fm um so we're seeing a lot of corruption in the realm of capricorn now the 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 so that's all going on and and i think that the thing that is the most important most palpable thing going on in Capricorn and on the Cardinal Cross as we change from 2021 to 2022 that sets the tone of the year is Venus conjunct, oop, Venus conjunct, where are you? Pluto in Capricorn during this very unusual Venus stationary retrograde stage. So when a planet station is retrograde, it's big emphasis on that planet and all the things uh, that it um that it represents. And there's a kind of um, movement to induce desperation among uh, people, kind of like the uh, toilet paper shortage of early 2020. Who ever heard of a toilet paper shortage? Well, in the United States. The land of milk and honey and lots of stuff and there's always a little extra. Well, there was a created toilet paper shortage. This can, uh, this can be, be done uh, in, in many different ways. And uh, there, there is a... Um, a, a desperate feeling to this. There's also a deep, passionate feeling uh, to, to this. And I, I will end on that as a happier note that there's going to be a lot of sexual discovery happening under this Venus stationing retrograde uh, conjunct Pluto because that tends to deepen feelings, deepen the emotions. And uh, that retrograde Venus wants to take you deep underneath the influences of the family, the government, society, church, and all these, uh, all, all of these structural elements, and find the real stuff at the middle of, deep, deep at the center of your feelings and, um, and, and what you want to experience and what you need to experience. There's a real level of need with Pluto conjunct, uh, Venus conjunct Pluto. Um, and um, as Al, Al Morrison summed up the, the, the great, great, late, amazing Al Morrison summed up the conjunction of, um, of of Venus and Pluto in one word, lust, as told to me by the woman he told it to, Debbie Kempton Smith, who noticed he had the Venus Pluto conjunction in his chart, and she said, "Oh, what's that mean?" And he and Al Morrison leans in, and he says, "Lust." 
So, lust. As far as I'm concerned, that's a beautiful thing. And this is lust, though, of a deep nature, of a penetrating, cra craving uh, what is under underneath all the things the Capricorn can represent. It can represent reticence and g guilt and shame and all of these things. Well, what happens when you crack that egg and get in there? What happens when, when you actually enter the feelings uh, that, that, that Venus wants to have? And there's going to be a lot to feel and a lot to experience under this influence. And by the way, the, this is going on right now. The station retrograde is 1219, so it's, it's going to last. It's lasting for weeks. These stations of Venus take a while. So we are in it and we're, we're experiencing it. And I would encourage anyone who is uh, feeling alive and curious to get underneath whatever it is you need to get underneath to, to get at the, the truth and the reality of your feelings. Okay, uh, that is my introduction to the cardinal cross of the heavens uh, as the planets now stand. Uh, I'll be back in um, some days with a, an introduction uh, to the fixed cross of the heavens, possibly sooner rather than later. I'd like to get this uh, stage of things uh, ready, uh, ready to go, and I am uh, planning on starting uh, the, uh, the the audio readings today, I've uh, researched all my cosmic and galactic sounds. Uh, these uh, readings are affordably priced. Um, it's uh, currently $99 for the whole set of 12 uh, readings. If you'd like, write to cscs at planetwaves.net and say you saw me on YouTube offering a discount coupon code, and we will send you a discount coupon code. If you say, we saw this on Planet Waves TV, please send me a discount coupon code. I promise you it will be a worthwhile discount coupon code, probably enough to pay for breakfast in this diner, which is getting expensive, owing to Venus conjunct Pluto type of activity going on. Okay, so I will see you uh, elsewhere around the Planet Waves uh, network. I'm planning to keep updating Planet Waves FM every Friday night uh, through through this time. There's just so much going on, and I know that people find a lot of uh, peace and consolation in Planet Waves, uh, Planet Waves FM Fridays at 10 Eastern at planetwaves.fm. Okay, so please click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and please avail yourself of the many uh, wonderful services that I and my team offer, because they make it possible for me to sit here and do this and, uh, and share this knowledge with you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Stay in touch. And bye for now. <laughs>